Here we go. I'm finally unmuted. Okay. It is 12 o'clock, so I think we'll go ahead and get started for the day. Um, I don't have a super full agenda, but kind of a little bit of a hodgepodge of different topics to talk about. So possibly get it done a little bit early, but always uh, willing to take questions from you as well. So just go through these beginning slides here quick. They should be pretty familiar to us at this point. Um, just a reminder why we're here to just give everyone an opportunity to connect and um, learn from each other and provide technical assistance. Uh, the, the specific topics that I want to cover today, um, just a quick update for all of you on the local board websites. Review uh, the field memo that was sent out yesterday regarding memorandums of understanding for the local areas for this program year. And also just give a quick overview of information on a disaster recovery national dislocated worker grant for the derecho. Um, so that doesn't affect everybody, but it does affect quite a few of the, you that um, are in leadership in your county. So we'll touch on that as well as just a couple of other reminders. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, as a reminder, gosh, it seems like a long time ago that we changed our deadlines from May 15th to September 1st because of COVID. And now here we are September 4th. Um, I believe most, if not all of you have completed all, if not the vast majority of these key tasks that were due by September 1st, which is a huge testament to the amount of effort and work that you've put into this. So thank you so much for your cooperation in getting those things off the ground, um, you know, really laying the foundation for us to be able to move forward in a WIOA con compliant way across the state. So um, kudos to all of you. Uh, just as a quick update, um, starting today, beginning next week, I'm gonna be going through the local board certification. So if you are a board chair or the CEO who's kind of in charge of getting that information to me, once you have uh, those board seats filled, please get that to me so that I can certify that. And then we'll go ahead and get you scheduled for local board training, which will be happening at the end of September, early uh, October for the local board. So that's a key big step that we're working on. And then at the end of the day today, I'll tech uh, touch on some of the other next steps that we'll be tackling. Um, the nice news is from a CEO perspective, your heavy lift is really done at this point. You know, you've, you've set these foundational pieces, you've gotten everybody in place once you have your local board and you have board staff, hopefully, and all of those things. So a lot of the work will start to shift from you all as CEOs to the local board and the board chairs um, and the board support staff. So one of the things that I think I might do, and I'll just kind of get your opinion about this at the end of the call as well today, is maybe expand these calls to not be specifically about CEOs, um, but make it be about local area leadership so that we can invite um, local board chairs, local board staff, who I think some of those are already attending, but sort of widen the audience so that everybody can continue to learn from each other. And um, obviously you all as CEOs are more than welcome to continue to attend and learn, um, or if you're, you're willing to step back and give those roles over to, to the local board and things like that, that's acceptable too. So we'll chat about that as well when we talk about some of the next steps. So exciting times. It felt like we were never gonna get here, but we did. So great job, everybody. Um, let's just quickly chat about the local board website. So um, most of your local areas have staff to the board. I think we're at eight out of nine that have staff to the board at this point. Um, those people were all invited to a training with Iowa Workforce Development tech, um, IT staff last week who provided um, training on how to administer and maintain those websites. So if you remember from our last CEO call, we're going to be going live with new local workforce development area websites that are linked to the state of Iowa Workforce Development Board website. Um, those will go live on September 15th and your local board staff or your local board would be responsible for maintaining that. This is the place where you post your public information about meetings, agendas, um, post your bylaws and your MOUs and all those types of documents that you'll wanna make sure are public. So um, I think that the board chairs were, seemed very pleased with the training. It went very well, was very thorough, and I think they're happy with what those products look like. Um, again, these are board, these are websites that IWD will provide, um, you know, free of charge to the local areas and um, you can maintain as long as you want. You also 100% have the option to go out and develop your own 
um, local area website and maintain that completely separately. And then all we would do is just provide a link to it on the state board website so people could find it. But um, again, as temporary or as permanent as you want these sites to be, that's up to your local area. Um, but that, that training did happen and it was very successful. So just a heads up and um, I will make sure to send an email to everybody when we do go live with those sites that you'll know exactly where they are. But again, you can get to them just by going out to the um, iowawdb.gov website. There's a link on the left-hand side right now. It still shows the regional one through 16 sites, but on September 15th, we'll change that to the new local area name. So that's pretty exciting stuff. Just a, just a heads up, nothing really to discuss here. Um, the biggest topic of the day would be to talk about the field memo um, on MOUs that I sent out yesterday. So, or I guess it was issued on Wednesday. Sorry, it is Friday, isn't it? Um, so many of you, I don't believe from a CEO perspective were involved in this discussion last year, but under WIOA, one of the requirements of each local area is to have what's called a memorandum of understanding or an MOU. I'm sure you're familiar with um, a term in those types of agreements uh, in, in the capacities that you serve in. But we all requires one for the workforce system in your local area. And um, typically they are designed to be written and then uh, maintained or updated every three years. So initially under WIOA um, in Iowa, there were MOUs in place from June 1st of 2019, or I'm sorry, sorry, June 1st of 2016 through, good Lord, I'm just gonna start all over. When WIOA went into effect, July 1 of 2016, MOUs were in effect through June 30 of 2019. Um, at that time, so last summer, we were supposed to be able to renegotiate and have WIOA compliant MOUs. Well, if we all remember where we were at in this process last summer, uh, we had recently had a vote by the state board to move to six local areas that was appealed to the um, department or the Secretary of Labor, and so things were up in the air. So. Um, what the Department of Labor allowed us to do was extend the existing MOUs, um, even though uh, we know that they are not WIOA compliant, they do not contain all of the required elements of a WIOA compliant MOU, but um, the thought process was it's better to be operating under some sort of an MOU than to not operate under one at all, because this is a document that pulls in all of the partners, right? So, so far you've worked on documents where all the CEOs representing each county are pulled together and working together and possibly service provider um, for Title I adult DW and youth programming. But if you remember back to training, there are quite a, quite a few required partners um, under the one-stop system of WIOA, um, all the way down from, you know, the Titles I, II, III, and IV core programs, but also, you know, all the way out to you know, your senior, uh, your CSEP programs and TANF and even HUD employment and training and things. So there are a lot of programs and partners that have to be cooperating for a one-stop system to be successful. And that's what the MOU is designed to do. So last summer, we were allowed to temporarily extend the MOUs for one year through June 30th of 2020. And um, hoping that by that point in time, we would have been farther along in the process where we were, you know, maybe possibly assuming that the six local area map was going to go forward and we would have been working on that longer. Well, again, we all know what happened. So here we are again, July 1st, 2020, um, a couple of months ago, and those temporary MOUs expired. We're still not yet in a place where we can um, issue and execute fully WIOA compliant MOUs. Um, one of the biggest reasons is that the state of Iowa has not yet issued policy on what that looks like. Um, and just to preface that, that is something that we are working on. MOU policy is not something that can be issued by IWD alone. It has to be done in conjunction with all of the core partners and then the required partners. So we um, have a core partner group that meets on a weekly basis that includes titles two and four, as, long, as well as one and three operated by IWD. And we're working on this policy. Um, and so that's something that we're working on. And in the meantime, though, again, we're kind of in the same place. What are we going to do? Do we operate uh, off of no MOUs or do we operate off some sort of temporary MOU? Um, so I did issue the field memo two days ago that allows each local area a couple of different options depending on um, your specific situation. And that does revolve or does allow for you to 
again extend the existing MOUs temporarily. Um, it also allows you to negotiate an MOU if you want to. The one big caveat to that is if you choose to renegotiate MOUs in your local area, um, you have to make sure that they are WIOA compliant and you will be doing that in the absence of state issued policy regarding a compliant MOU um, because it has not been issued yet. So that's a choice that you can make. Um, for the local areas that have combined um, from previous areas, so for example, I see you, Jack, so Mississippi Valley, um, you know, you're combined from two previous local areas. So one of the options for you would be to just extend both of the MOUs that were existing before, so realistically the Region 9 MOU and the Region 10 MOU, or sorry, Region 16 MOU. Um, I also provided you an option to execute a new temporary MOU. There was a template attached um, for just the Mississippi Valley local area, or that third option of fully negotiating a WIOA compliant MOU in the local area. Um, we would like a temporary MOU to be in place by October 31st because, again, we're already operating without them. And um, the sooner we can get them back in place, the better. Um, being that it's September 4th, you know, to, to fully execute a WIOA compliant MOU by October 31st is going to be probably a, a pretty large task. So, um, but, but really, it's up to you all. So, just wanted to give you a brief overview of what was in that field memo. I don't intend to read it to you or anything like that, but does anybody have any questions um, or comments regarding that that we can talk through today? Hey, Michelle, this is Kyle Stecker. Hi, Kyle. Um, walk me through the process of how you would go through a new WIOA compliant MOU without having any policy to go off of. I mean, that just seems ridiculous. You know, I, I don't disagree. Um, it would be very difficult. You would have to just follow what's in the federal law. And um, a WIOA compliant MOU does include um, an infrastructure funding agreement, which is an agreement that is how all the partners agree to pay for the one-stop system as well. And that's really the kicker. That's the hard part, right? Um, and so I, I agree that it would be very difficult for you to do that, but it is an option and, and that's why we put it in there. I guess, Michelle, this is Jack, Willie. Yeah, hi Jack. Um, and on the, the, um, thing that I got in the mail, it says August 25th and then it says, um, Mississippi Valley, Northeast, Western, and South Central Iowa, a local workforce development boards, and then there's an A, B, C, that's what you were talking about before, because I was trying to take notes, and, yep. and, and that's what you were dis discussing with us. Absolutely, yep. Oh, thank you, that clarifies it. Sorry, I guess I didn't check to when I issued it on the 2nd to update the date that still says August 25th on the actual document, but I sent the email on the 2nd. Yes, I'm sorry. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Thank you. Michelle, this is Lori. There is just one thing um, to add. Sure. Um, for, for the benefit of you all on the call today, since the majority of you all are um, chief elected officials, this is not a task that is that is in your um, wheelhouse. This is not a task that is on your plate um, to see that it gets done. The, the law is very clear that this is a task of the local workforce development board. Um, however, the MOU to be fully executed also has to be signed by the Clio, but it is not on your plate to cause it to happen, um, but you are a, a player and a partner in it. Um, I know we haven't talked a whole lot about um, roles and responsibilities that the chief elected officials have in conjunction with the local workforce board, 
Um, but this one um, does fall into that category. And again, your role in it is that you, um, you agree to it. You agree with the work that the local board does to convene the partners um, to produce the MOU. Um, but it is not on your plate to um, make it happen. Thanks for adding that, Lori. And I, and I would just add on top of that, <laughs> that, um, you know, while Lori is absolutely correct, I think I also understand that we're still transitioning. We still have boards that in some places are in their infancy and might not be able to fully tackle something like this, which might be another point to yours, Kyle, that it would be very difficult to do anything really besides re-execute or extend the ones that are already existing. Um, during this point in time. And I think that once um, we have that, that uh, state policy available, this is something that will require a lot of training and a lot of technical assistance for local areas, which we're prepared to give um, when, we, when we do that. But again, it's something that we do have to do in conjunction with our partner agencies as well. So, um, yeah. Hey, Michelle, do, do you have any timeline as far as when, like, drafts or whatever for the infrastructure funding agreement will come out? Oh, Lord, Kyle. Um, <laughs> that, so what we're, the way we are drafting it right now is really kind of in two pieces, which I know doesn't make a ton of sense because the IFA is really an integral part of the MOU. But what we are aiming to do is the next state board meeting is on October 23rd. It's a Friday. And so probably here in the next couple of weeks, uh, myself, along with our core partners, we're going to be posting several policy uh, drafts for public comment because that is the process that we go through for all the policies, if you remember. Um, and one of them is going to be about just the structure of the MOU itself, not including the IFA piece. Um, so we want to get that out as soon as possible so that boards and areas can start working on that piece and then adding the IFA piece in as soon as possible. And Lori can um, kind of back me up on this, but that piece is by far the most difficult piece <laughs> of WIOA as a whole. <laughs> and yes. um, we've actually been working on it with our core partners for, God, when were you here, Lori, and we met in person? I mean, it was last oh, that summer, was, I think. That was like 17 years ago, but I think it was January, actually. It feels like it. Yeah, it was January, because when we went to the CEO meeting. Right. You're right. Um, and so I would love to be able to give you a timeline, Kyle, but it is a monumental task that we're trying to tackle right now. Um, so I would like to say hopefully within the next six months, we can put that IFA piece out. Um, and again, you know, one of the things that I have to do is um, provide a, an update to the Department of Labor every month about where we're at. And I did that yesterday for August. And they're very pleased with the amount of progress that we're making. And so I think that you know, this is one of those pieces, again, that we're not going to be expected to, okay, you now have nine local areas on September or on July 1st, so now everybody has to have every piece of this in place within the next two months. That's not going to happen. As long as we continue to move forward and make progress, we'll continue to do those things. Um, one of the benefits uh, in Iowa uh, surrounding the IFA piece, and also one of the things that makes it a little bit more challenging is, is that we have state appropriations in Iowa that support and function in, within these one-stop centers that many states don't have to, to include. So that's one of the things that we're also working on trying to figuring that out. And in the meantime, I think almost, not almost, all of the existing local one-stop centers have a good foundation in place for how to pay for the centers and maintain them and they're not going anywhere. So um, from that perspective, it's not something that needs to be done immediately. Um, but in order for us to be able to get that full wheel compliant, you know, badge stamped on us, you know, it, it is something we'll have to tackle eventually. So long winded answer. I'm sorry. Um, and it didn't give you a very definite answer, but just know we're working on it. Well, okay. Yeah. That, that answers my question. And if good. it's that big of a piece, that's understandable. Yeah. Um, fun. one thing I was, other thing I was going to ask in response to Lori's comment that this was more of a local board task than CEOs. Um, are the local board members being included in these conversations and stuff? Like we have office hours and stuff. 
are they being given the same information we are because I don't really know that they're anywhere near up to speed as much as I'd say me and Barry and some of the others from region three, four are, or old region three, four, yep. um, Northwest and stuff. So, I mean, I don't, I was kind of curious to see what communication they're getting as local board members. Yep. So, um, and yeah, absolutely. And so one of the things that we've done, and we've kind of done this pretty methodically and the same for every sort of, um, key player, right? And if you remember back, and it, oddly enough, it's been a year ago this September that we did our cross-country tour of Iowa with Lori in tow and um, did, did training for you all. And so that's what we're going to start here coming at the end of the month, end of September, early October, is each of your nine local workforce development boards is going to get an individualized training session with mayor and mayor um, and my team, obviously, uh, just together to start learning their roles and responsibilities. And I think that's the first step. That's the first step we took with you all as CEOs and then we just continue to build on that. So they're gonna get that training here starting in a couple of weeks. And then absolutely, and that's what I mentioned at the beginning of the call, that I think it'll be really important for us to sort of rebrand these calls, not as CEO office hour calls necessarily, but just as we owe a leader, local leadership office hours calls maybe and open it up to um, most definitely local board chairs and local board support. I think most of the local board support are already attending, um, but also, you know, any other local board members that would want to join as well. So I am very open to that and that's up to you guys. I mean, if you would rather we maintain a CEO office hour call and do something separate for local board members, then, then I can organize it however it makes sense to you all, so. Okay. Uh, any other questions about the MOUs for now? And obviously I know that's a lot of information to process. So, you know, you know where to find me if you have any questions later on. No? Okay. So the next thing that was scheduled on the list to talk about is um, just to give you a quick update for a meeting that's happening this afternoon. And um, Wendy Greenman, who's my bureau chief over the Title I programs, which would include National Dislocated Worker Grants, sent an invitation, I think Wednesday afternoon or yesterday morning. Um, I know that's a short time frame, and I know that's a very quick turnaround and there's not a lot of notice. I apologize for that. Um, but what we're looking at doing is filing an emergency application for a disaster recovery national dislocated worker grant for the derecho storm that happened on August 10. And so there's an informational call today with local level leadership of the counties listed on the screen. These are the counties that have been declared eligible for public assistance categories A through G under the FEMA disaster declaration. And so um, any of those counties can work together as a part of their local area. So if you are a CEO from one of these local one from a local area that includes one of these counties um, you are invited to this call as well as the CEOs specifically from these counties um, because what you would do is the local area would uh, the state of Iowa will apply to the federal government for um, a national dislocated worker grant and then the local areas would be able to apply to us to receive funding and what the disaster recovery NDWG does it's different from the COVID-19 NDWG that we've talked about in the past couple of months and that that was a employment uh, recovery disaster NDWG. So that's really designed more to help similar, very similarly to regular dislocated worker funds and help dislocated workers related to COVID-19 uh, get back to work. A disaster recovery NDWG is very specific in that it is designed to provide funding for um, temporary jobs to aid in the disaster cleanup in areas that were uh, declared eligible. So what the funding allows is for, um, it might be your local FEMA agency, it might be your local, you know, county um, cleanup, you know, just your local county would be able to um, get funding to pay 100% of salary 
for people to be hired for temporary jobs up to 12 months to aid in the disaster cleanup, along with the ability to rent equipment for those people to be able to join crews and things like that. Because, you know, one of the things might be, well, you know, our county crew could use 20 people, but we would need extra dump trucks. No problem. This, this NDWG can pay for extra dump trucks and things like that. So it's a really good opportunity to get some extra money into the local area to help with the cleanup. And so that's what the call this afternoon will be about. Um, I believe, Wendy, are you on the call today? I think you are. Um, that call this afternoon will be recorded. Um, and then also uh, myself or Wendy are available at any time to answer questions about this. But the call today's purpose is to really explain um, what funding is available and how the funding can be used. And then also to talk to the senior leadership of these eligible counties, cities, whatever, to figure out um, from a high level, you know, how many people would you maybe be able to hire and for how long and what types of jobs would they do and what types of equipment would you need so that we can get an estimate to include on our emergency application for how much funding the state needs. Um, Iowa is currently in use of a disaster recovery NDWG for the flooding of 2019. Um, it's most heavily being used on the western part of the state down in like Fremont, Mills County, those areas where the flooding was um, pretty tremendous. And so they're operating an NDWG program right now down there. And so this would be an additional ability to get some of this funding into the state. So um, if there's anybody that has any questions about this right now, I can definitely answer or you'll have the ability to join this call this afternoon if it, if it applies to you. Hey, Michelle, it's Kyle. Yeah. I don't, it does, this doesn't necessarily apply to me, but I actually did go down to Cedar Rapids and help some family out be uh -huh. because I knew how bad it was down there. Good for so, you. Like, what do you do if most of the stuff's done by the time this would all get approved? <laughs> oh, Kyle, I'm, I'm it, not laughing at you. I'm back? laughing at I mean, you because it's I, a very... I know there's a lot to go left. Don't get me wrong. Yeah but there's a lot that has been done. Yep. So, I mean, can it go backwards in time and pay for stuff that's already been completed? Oh God, I don't know. Lori, do you know off the top of your head or Wendy? Um, typically there's, if it can, when you get the award, it'll say it, but typically yeah. there is a start date. Um, uh -huh. it, it could very well come in effective as of the day of the storm. Um, yeah. You know, one of the biggest issues, Kyle, with this type of disaster grant is the fact that you need the, the help and the money immediately. And it takes time to get through the red tape of the government to actually get the funds. Um, and so that is, that is by far one of the biggest complaints I have. And I think across the country, it's echoed that these grants are not necessarily as effective as you want them to be because the money is needed almost immediately. Um, so that, you know, unfortunately that's, there's not a lot we can do about that. We have to operate within the confines of the law related to these funds. But, um, one of the things that they have clarified, I know is in the past, it's always been temporary jobs to aid for disaster cleanup on public lands, right? Um, so you would clean up parks, you could clean up roadways, ditches, all those types of things. Um, they have expanded the definition a little bit more to include private property if it's impeding on Wendy, if you can dive in here, it's impeding on like the health and safety of the general public or something like that. So I think that's a great thing that will give us a little bit more leeway and where and how we can use these funds to help for cleanup. Um, one of the things that I would think about, Kyle, is I agree. I mean, I think there was tons of people that immediately went there, you know, with their personal chainsaws and all that. I mean, Iowa Nice is a real thing, right? And um, helped people clean up their yards. But you know, have city crews worried about cleaning up parks yet or, or, you know, more rural parts of the thing where it wasn't necessarily an immediate need. I mean, those are the areas that you're talking about maybe finally being able to reach by adding additional staff and um, equipment to, to the issue. So um, that's why it's important for the senior leadership. And like, you know, if you are a CEO in, in one of these counties and you, I'm assuming you have uh, contact and communication with your emergency management people and your, um, you know, your county works office people. And, and so they're the type of people that are going to be able to say, well, hey, there's still this huge project over here. And this is how many people we would need and for how long and what kind of equipment. So it really requires quite a bit of a collaborative effort also. Um, so that's why the call this afternoon and just to gather information and, and to pull it in. Obviously, if it's not useful, then it's not something that we apply for. 
but it's obviously something we want to look at if in any way we can we can get some money and I mean if it ends up only being you know a million dollars for Lynn County only because Cedar Rapids is still the only place that needs help I doubt that's true right then that's what it could be it could be 20 million dollars because all of these county needs help I mean um, so so we just have to have the data and the information to, to back up the ask so that's what we're looking for today and probably into next week Michelle this is Jim Irwin yeah Hey, I was, so hi. Um, so to follow up on this, the conversation, so this is money that that we as workforce development areas would apply for yep. to be able to, to distribute? Absolutely. So okay. because the goal is to hire, um, it, there's a hierarchy of, of the types of people that can fill these temporary jobs, but um, it's, it's designed to take dislocated workers and get them into temporary jobs. Right. So let's say your, um, you know, county office, your county work center, they need, they currently employ, you know, 20 guys, but they could use 20 more for the next three months. So this, this funding would be able that the local area would apply from the state, we would give you, you know, a million dollars to pay people the same wage that everybody else is getting, they have to get paid the same amount. So you can't, you know, underpay them or anything. So they're going to start getting paid 25 bucks an hour to, and, and we'll rent chainsaws and we'll rent dump trucks, whatever is needed for them to go clear out a park or do whatever it takes. And if that's three months, four months, six months, whatever it takes, um, the working together with the local county emergency management people and stuff, you would identify work sites that need assistance and, um, and all of those things. So that's absolutely what it's for. And then essentially you use the vast majority of the funding to pay someone's salary. So it's really a win-win, right? Because the, the county works or the city works or whoever can get full-time employees, um, you know, temporary full-time employees paid 100% through these federal funds and, um, but get the extra help they need immediately to get some things going. So that's, yeah, that's exactly what it's for. So this is more for cities and counties, not necessarily for a private business to try to get up and go on to help do stuff. Right. It's, it's not going to be for private businesses because, um, as I said, the requirement is typically to help do cleanup in public okay. areas. Um, now, if there are, again, I think that there's some um, leeway we have a little bit now with this notion of if there are private lands that are causing health or safety hazards, that they could help there, but you're not going to be able to give the money for a business to hire somebody. No. So that is the one, the one difference, right, is um it's it's for public emergency cleanup and these are fema funds right um well that's not true they're dol funds but it's working closely with fema so um it's that's the that's where i think the the push for public i'm going to kind of follow up on kyle's conversation then because i mean uh we you know the, i'll just speak for clinton county so we had you know we're on the list we uh -huh. had quite a bit of damage, uh, trees, the trees and stuff, uh, you know, we're down. We'd spent a lot of time with our, our county trucks and we also had state trucks inside the city limits of Clinton, just helping them clean up and haul. Uh -huh. um, I guess our, you know, my thing is, is, you know, if we would go for something like this and save us for Clinton County, but you know, if we do it for three months and we get done in a month and a half, you know, can we reach out and go help a Cedar, you know, a, a, a Cedar County or a Jones County or, or go to Lynn County to help clean up a Cedar Rapids? Can we take the, that same staff that we hired for that, if that's something that we would do? Do you know if that's a possibility or not? That's a really interesting question. Um, I don't know, but Wendy is listening, so I will make sure Wendy is writing that down and that we um, find that out because I've never had anybody... I think my first thought was you asked for, you thought it would take three months. It only took a month and a half. Then they're just done, but they're already trained. They know what to do. They can go help somewhere else. I don't know why we wouldn't do that. So, um, yeah, we can definitely yeah. I mean, I don't know if anybody's been through Cedar Rapids. I mean, Kyle has, and, and you know, anybody that's on, but Cedar Rapids is holy smokes. It's, right. it's amazing. I mean, it, it's unbelievable the damage that they have there. So, yep. So a uh, great question that we will write down and, and look into. Okay. Just for some perspective, um, whenever I worked at a local, this is Lori, whenever I worked at a local workforce area here in Kentucky years and years ago, we got one of these um, for 
an ice storm that we had that damaged a lot of property um, in several counties. And we had a lot of the same questions at that point about, you know, well, whenever it first happened, there was a, a very quick emergency response. What the timing of this doesn't really seem like it's, it's to help in an emergency. So I, I hear where you're coming from on that one, Kyle. What, um, what our counties that were declared emergency disaster areas by FEMA ended up doing quite a bit is they hired a few extra people um, on their road crews, um, some even in their recycling centers, um, because they started um, handling some of the road debris at the recycle center. And I can't speak to what it was that they did, but I know that, that they added some folks there. Um, and then we, they um, worked to um, help repair around um, public properties, um, schools, senior citizen center, even cemeteries um, in some cases. And then they, they also went out into the really rural parts of the county where the trees were downed and it wasn't necessarily a tree, trees that needed to be removed for life to get back to normal. But if they didn't get removed, they could cause further problems eventually with blocking streams and creeks and different things like that. So they were able to use a good portion of the staff to um, clean up issues that were a result of the storm, but uh, were to prevent, were to mitigate further damage down the road. And we ended up getting that, we, we ended up having it for a year. Um, I don't think we had people that ended up working for a year, but um, probably more like in the six to nine month range. Um, but, and it was a similar higher individuals um, who had been dislocated or who needed skills to get a job and, and those sorts of things. And so a lot of the county road departments ended up um, hiring some of these folks on full time after the grant ended and, and those sorts of things. Yeah, there's a lot of great opportunity here. And, and I would second that, Lori. I mean, I think that, you know, the immediate stuff, the stuff that you see on the news and that you know about is the, the roads that were blocked and all that stuff is, is, has happened, right? But where are the places across the county that haven't been um, tackled yet because the immediate needs needed to happen? And so it's even cleaning out ditches so that the culverts aren't blocked or uh, there's a lot of different things. Or even if, you know, you need to hire people to run a wood chipper 24 seven to get rid of all these trees. I mean, there's a lot of ways I'm thinking we could probably figure out to use it. So the good news is, is the sooner that we have an idea of how much money we want to ask for. Um, unfortunately, we can't just call the feds up and say, we want $20 million. We have to be able to say, we want $20 million to serve, you know, this many participants because the point of this and the reason that it's coming through the department of labor is to get people to work. Right. So, it is about temporary jobs and then the result of those temporary jobs is disaster cleanup. So we have to be able to say how many participants we want to serve and for how long and things like that in a ballpark figure. Once we get that, because this is an emergency application, um, it comes pretty quickly. We get the money pretty quickly and we can start distributing it right away. So that's the, that's the benefit. So I would venture to guess, especially because we're running up against the end of a federal fiscal year on September 30th, that we could have money in the hands of local areas pretty quickly around September 30th. So don't quote me on that, but that would be the goal. So anyways, um, yeah, I think the call this afternoon will have a little bit more information on it. So please feel free if you are in a county for that's been affected and would be eligible to share that conference information um, with anybody. And um, uh, geez, Wendy, if you could just put it uh, in the chat so people could write it down when I get off the screen, the phone number and the conference code, that would be great. So, okay. That was hey, the Michelle, last thing that I, more, oh, sorry, go ahead, Kyle. For you there. Um, I don't, I was just kind of curious how it works because I know you said the point of it was for getting dislocated workers back to work and all that, but like if you start talking running trucks or heavy equipment and stuff like that one whether it's just the experience and skill of how to do it or the 
qualifications as far as a CDL, stuff like that. I mean, are you able to really get some of those people that have those skills already if with dislocated worker stuff, or are you going to have to contract with people who are already trained to do that? You, that's a great question, Kyle. So you can, you can do both. I mean, obviously if there are people available, then you can hire them if they already have the qualifications. One of the ways that sometimes people do it is, you know, so I have a county crew of 20 and usually 10 of them drive trucks and, and 10 of them are, I'm just making this stuff up. I have no idea what I'm talking about, but the other 10 are, you know, walking along and picking up the branches. Well, you can take the the 20 permanent employees and spread them out across the trucks and then hire 20 people to walk alongside that maybe don't have the qualifications, right? So maybe it allows um, a county or a city crew to utilize the staff they have in different ways to plug in with these temporary employees um, in, in other ways as well. The other thing that you do have the ability to do is combine um, an enrollment into this program with your regular dislocated worker funds and send somebody to get their CDL um, to get them that training and certification they would need to help you do some of those things. So that's an option too. I know that they're taking advantage of that in um, the southwestern part of the state um, from the flooding grants in um, 2019. So there's lots of different combinations there that you can definitely do. Yeah, that's good to know. I was just curious on that. So yep. thanks. Yep. Okay. Um, so that was the last thing officially on my agenda and on my slides. But of course, leading up to this, I had a couple of things that I wanted to um, just talk through. So really quickly, Lori and her team have been helping immensely with the youth RFP. And so that is going to be done here, I would say, in the next week or so, and we'll be able to get that out to you um, for use. Um, And we'll also then combine that with the adult DW RFP template so that you have a combination if you want to just do one RFP for all three. So maybe at our next CEO office hours call, we can go over that and you'll have that available for your local boards to um, do that next process of, of doing the RFP in the areas that have not already done it yet. Um, and get that done. The other thing I want to just remind you all is that you should have all received, again, um, the CLEOs, I'm sorry, uh, a fiscal agent training scheduled for September 16th, and I just would encourage you all to attend again if you can, because Mayor has done a phenomenal job of sort of revamping the training from the first time that we did it in June and adding some additional information, so I think that you'll find that helpful. Um, This time around, after the training is over and completed, it will be recorded and posted online for everyone to access as well. So just a quick plug. Um, Additionally, as I talked about at the beginning of the call, our September 1st deadline has come and gone, and I think most of you have already sent me in information regarding your local boards. So I'm going to be working to get those certified starting today and next week. And I will be emailing you back feedback if you need to make some changes. And then I'll also be emailing about getting board training scheduled. So if you have a staff to the board, I will be in contact with that person to get that taken care of. And if you don't, I will figure out a different way to get that scheduled for you. So um, one of the other things that is on our list of things to do coming up, which again, this is actually a responsibility of Um, the local board in conjunction with you all, but is the RFP for a one-stop operator. And so currently that is on our task list to be accomplished by December 31st. Um, I think, you know, I'm talking with mayor and everyone to make sure that that's really a feasible task, but assuming that it is, that is also something that we need to be giving some technical assistance for coming up. So just be prepared that, um, you know, we are aware that it's on the list and we are aware that we'll provide, that, that you'll need some technical assistance around that. So that's something we'll be working on as well, hopefully in the next um, CEO office hours calls or, or two. And then um, most of you again have then identified who your fiscal agent is, which is awesome, congratulations. So one of the next steps will be for IWD to put in place our master agreement with your fiscal agents. And when we do that, we'll be able to release the remaining um, program year 20 youth funds to you right away. And then um, as you all know, October 1st is when the FY21 
um, adult DW or the nine month money becomes available right around there, depending on when DOL decides to give it to us. Um, so that will be coming. So one of the other things that we may need to do here in the next few weeks is meet again to discuss if your local, uh, your existing service provider contracts, the ones that have the temporary contracts through December 31st, if they're needing any additional funding or if we should put all that funding into contract with the fiscal agent, those types of things. So I will be um, looking at that and sending some information out to you and um, setting up meetings to discuss if we need. And obviously, if you have any questions in the meantime, just reach out. But those are just some of the um, next upcoming things that, that we'll be working on. So that's all I have today. Um, anybody else have any questions, thoughts, concerns? funny stories for a Friday of a holiday weekend, you know, anything. Michelle, did you, this is Heather Garcia, did you talk about the COVID-19 grant and when those applications might be available? I did not. Thank you though, Heather. Um, we filed our final application. So the way that those uh, emergency NDWGs work is we file an emergency application, which for COVID we did back in um, the summer. And so the final application, the full application was due yesterday. We filed it on Monday. And so we're waiting to hear back from DOL, but we should be able to start. Um, I have not received the notice of that uh, award yet from the Fed. So as soon as I get that from them, which means they've given us the $1.6 million, we can start contracting it out. So I'm hopeful in the next couple of weeks, we will have that and we'll make the official announcement for your ability to apply for funding. Michelle, it's Miranda. Yeah. So when you know that notice is released, um, how, detailed are we going to have to be? Are we going to already have to have those partnerships established? I mean, specifically for Mississippi Valley, we focused on OJTs. Um, are we going to need to have those businesses identified to put in our proposal? Well, Wendy, what are your thoughts? I honestly haven't looked at that one in a while because I'm in the middle of working on a couple of grants right now, so we're all blending together. But um, I... Yeah, hi, Michelle. Yep, I'm on. And Please, thank you. <laughs> hi, Miranda. Yeah, we have started a RFP template. So um, I can't remember off the top of my head exactly what that specific question asks, but I can take a look at it and let you know and give you a little bit of a heads up. But basically, once we would release the RFP for applications, you would get some time to um, obviously complete it before a due date, but I can definitely take a look at that specific question and get back to you. And I think too, Wendy, just Great. kind of spitballing here on the phone. Uh, so this is just off the cuff and not to be held, you know, as gospel or anything. But I think Miranda, if you have a plan that details that you want to, you know, do an OJT for 20 people and you're going to focus on you know, this industry sector that's in demand and yada, 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 that you don't have the specific partnerships with employers quite yet is okay, right? And, and what we don't want and what will not be allowed to happen is that a local area just says, well, we want $100,000. Why, right? <laughs> You're going to have to tell us why and how you plan to use it and how you plan to serve people, how many people you plan to serve, what do you expect their outcomes to be? You know, is there is, are, is the funding to make sure that you can send 50 people to training? And, you know, um, how long will those trainings take? Those types of things. So it's just really designed to give us an idea that you have a plan in place for how these funds will be used so that they're used effectively and efficiently instead of just maybe what's been done in the past, our fault as well, right? Because we allowed it to happen, which was just, we just want this much and then not a whole lot of accountability on the back end, right? So putting in place some parameters for an application just allows for accountability of the funds and to make sure that we are meeting the required performance metrics because there are performance or metrics attached, right? So um, I think you'll be okay, Miranda, even if you don't have a specific employer lined up. Okay, that's good to hear. I mean, we, um, Title I and Title Three met yesterday and kind of had a briefing over, you know, how we could move forward with that. and. We've got a several businesses that are potentially interested, but I don't know that we could have those, you know, relationships completely secured by the time we'd have to. Yeah. 
proposal. Absolutely. And, you know, OJTs for anybody else that's thinking about this is, this is a phenomenal opportunity to do OJTs because that's not something that typically happens a lot with Title I funds because they are expensive, right? You're paying somebody's wages. So getting extra funding in through this grant is a great opportunity and it's such a win-win for everybody, right? The, the employer wins, the participant wins. And so, um, you know, I think that's a great thing. And I, and I know, Miranda, you guys have been planning on that and I'm, I'll throw you under the bus here. I'm sure you'd be willing to talk to your counterparts and let them know what you guys are thinking um because the more people we can get into that the you know the better for everybody so and yes i would be willing to talk to anybody who is interested in learning more about it any other questions for today Okay. Well, it doesn't sound like it. So I will end the call by saying thank you so much for all of your hard work. Um, I hope you all get to enjoy a wonderful Labor Day weekend and we will talk next week, I'm sure. Thank you. You also. Bye. Thank you.